All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for attending this um, introduction to composting and vermicomposting uh, webinar. And I'm Debbie Schnorr. I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator for UC Cooperative Extension of San Bernardino County. And with me today helping with this webinar are co-host uh, Shirley Chu, and she'll be monitoring the chat and le letting people in from the waiting room. And then we have Barbara Dawson, uh, Master Gardener, and she is going to be talking about composting. And then I will um, uh, talk about vermicomposting. All right, a few, a few housekeeping items. Um, this presentation is being recorded and we are going to uh, post this on our YouTube channel and you'll be able to get to it also on the Master Gardener website. And so feel free to ask questions as we go along and put them in the chat. And then we plan to answer the questions um, at the end of each section, uh, composting and vermicomposting, but we may take a few uh, moments during the presentation just to see uh, what's in the chat and answer questions then. Uh, but uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, please um, let us know. And then also, um, as soon as we uh, start the presentation, now might be a good time. Uh, let's turn off our video uh, just to make sure that we're saving on bandwidth and it flows smoothly. And then if you're not speaking, uh, put your mic on mute. And then if there's anything in the chat that you want to save for later, you can uh, save the chat by going to the three dots on the right hand side of the chat window and choosing save chat. In case you're not familiar with uh, UC Cooperative Extension, it's a collaboration between the University of California and counties throughout California, and each county has its own programs. In San Bernardino County, we have the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, FNEP. We have the Youth Development Program, 4-H, Master Gardeners, Master Food Preservers, and Environmental Education. And we also have academic advisors in uh, areas like natural resources, uh, horticulture, uh, urban ag, and uh, many more. And then the San Bernardino County Master Gardeners are part of uh, UCCE, Cooperative Extension, which is part of UCANR. That's the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division and Master Gardeners are trained volunteers. And we share information uh, with the public that has been um, peer reviewed and is evidence-based. And that's research from University of California, other universities and other trusted sources. And we give uh, talks and provide education on a wide variety of topics, including seasonal, seasonal gardening, composting, sustainable landscaping, uh, such as water conservation, native plants, seed saving, uh, many different topics. And just a few words on the environmental education program. Um, it's a relatively new program I've been um, uh, working as the coordinator for about three years. And our mission is really to uh, promote environmental awareness in our communities and promote sustainable uh, practices. And some of the areas we've been working on are uh, composting, uh, waste reduction and recycling, uh, especially uh, since um, uh, we have Senate Bill 1383, which mandates that we keep organic waste out of the landfills, uh, food preservation as it relates to food waste reduction, and um, hydroponics. We have a hydroponics loan program for schools uh, where we loan equipment uh, for free on a semester by semester basis. 
Uh, we can also help uh, new composting sites uh, get up and running with our composting quick start program. We can perform uh, food waste audits and um, uh, give presentations, workshops, classes on many different environmental topics, such as composting and vermicomposting. So today we're gonna to be talking about uh, two different types of composting, the traditional backyard composting and then vermicomposting with worms. And with each of those, uh, we'll talk about the what and why, uh, the basic ingredients, the process, best practices and systems. And then I'll give a little summary at the end and we will do a Q and A at the end of each section. Um, and maybe somewhere uh, in between, uh, depending on the questions. So please put your questions in the chat. And then uh, if we uh, start talking about your question and you wanna come off of mute, that's fine too. And so I just wanna start with a question for everyone. Um, please just write your answer in the chat. Um, how much composting experience do you have? Uh, is it none and you just want to learn something about composting? Are you a beginner? Are you just starting out um, maybe successfully or unsuccessfully? Have you tried it? Uh, intermediate would be a year or more and you've, you've integrated composting into your, um, into your routine or maybe you're advanced and uh, you're working in larger scale composting at one of our waste companies or doing composting at a farm or a community garden. And uh, Shirley, what, uh, what are some of the responses that we see so far? I have Becky, Betsy that says intermediate. Okay, anyone else? I have Erin that says intermediate but lazy cold composting. <laughs> <laughs> cold composting is great, just takes longer. <laughs> That's great. Anybody else want to chime in? All right. I have Michelle tried for years to compost in the mountains in a wooden bin, but the environment didn't seem to allow good compost. Yes, it is definitely um, harder to do it in the mountains uh, because of the part of it is the is the weather and part of it is the materials that are available in different seasons. But um, yeah, hopefully we can talk about that later. But no matter what uh, level of experience you have, hopefully we have a little bit of something uh, for you. All right, I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Barbara. And uh, she's going to tell you about uh, backyard composting. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, actually, I've done cold composting a lot. <laughs> that seems to be my method lately. But um, uh, Debbie's right in that it takes a lot longer, but it, it is doable. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. So what is it? Uh, it is a combination of different uh, items, uh, most of which are available from your yard or from your um, home that, uh, that include things like grass clippings, uh, food scraps, leaves. Um, there are other parts of it we're going to talk about in the, in the next slide. But um, when all this starts to decay, along with some other things that we could be, I'm gonna say adding, but I'm gonna put quotes around that because you're not really adding anything uh, physical. It's just a matter of doing some steps that help with uh, the process of composting. So, okay, next slide, please. Okay, why is it important? It reduces landfill waste. Um, and therefore greenhouse gas emissions, because methane is one of the worst greenhouse gases there are. Uh, it decrease, decreases the need for chemical fertilizers. Uh, it reduces, it improves water quality because we don't have, and then, you know, we don't have nitrite fertilizers. We can actually use this instead. Also, it will break down soil so it is actually usable for uh, plantings for in your garden. And um, I know I've used compost 
with my clay soil and adding that really produces a nice uh, combination, a nice, um, what I wanna say, uh, structure for planting. And if you use it as a mulch, if you actually put it on top around your plants, it actually reduces uh, weeds growing in and around your plant. And uh, we're using, well, we can call it, when you think of mulch, I know a lot of people might think of uh, chips, but um, this is also can be used as a mulch. Okay, next slide, please. Basic ingredients um, of composting. We have organic materials, water, air, and um, managing those ingredients will actually uh, in, improve temperature inside a compost pile because there are some things uh, that you can do to keep that pile nice and hot. And that's where the hot composting comes in, which actually breaks down the materials a lot faster than if you do uh, cold composting. For me, it, that would be like totally ignoring the compost pile, but eventually it will break down and just takes a lot longer. Okay, next slide, please. So when we do composting, there are two types of materials that we add to a compost pile. There are things that we call the browns, which include um, wood chips. And when I say wood chips, I'm not talking about thing, something that you would buy at the store in a bag. I'm talking about if you trim a tree and um, put that in a chipper machine and compost what comes out because these materials really need to be small. The larger they are, the harder it take, the longer it takes to break down. Okay, uh, sawdust. Um, I, I've heard about sawdust that you shouldn't add too much, but I'm going to look into it a little bit more about that. Dry leaves, straw, although you gotta be careful with straw, sometimes it actually contains uh, seeds in it. So that's why you really need that hot compost pile. Plant stalks, twigs, shredded newspaper. You could also add cardboard as long as it's shredded. And I've added things like uh, peanut shells that I think those work really well because they're easily crushable and they are a brown item. Okay, next slide, please. Also part of the compost bin are items that are high nit nitrogen and something I forgot to mention with the browns, you, oh, you probably read it. The browns are the carbon sources and the greens here are high in nitrogen such as raw vegetable and fruit scraps. Um, I do not put, uh, excuse me, put vegetables in my compost pile. I really try to stick with raw. Coffee grounds, crushed eggshells, both of which I've used. Um, well, cut flowers once they, uh, once they are done in your house. Uh, grass clippings and uh, any kind of garden trimmings. And that could include um, if you uh, trim a tree and it has fresh leaves on it, it still has leaves on the uh, branches, those would be considered greens as well. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so we have a backyard composting ingredient list. Um, if you notice that there are items like, uh, if you look on the brown, on the left-hand side, it states all the warnings and precautions you should be aware of when you add these items to your uh, compost bin. Now, the coffee grounds are greens, but if you use a coffee filter, that's considered a brown. So you... So actually, so if you take that the whole coffee filter out of your coffee pot, if you have like a drip coffee pot where you actually use filters, you're actually adding browns and greens. So if you notice that things like corn stalks are very slow to decompose 
And of course, um, I just before I I'm not going to go over this whole list because I think it would take quite a long time, but um, to discuss everything. But if you if the video when the video is available, you can actually take a look at this and maybe print up a copy to have it as a guide. I'm going to get to that. You know, um, actually, I think I want to. Uh, answer that in the chat real quick. I'm gonna go real quick. That you don't use uh, eggshells because they might attract um, critters like raccoons. And I've always been concerned about that because I've a, I've had problems with rats before. I try to bury that stuff as deep as I can. Now I know animals tunnel, but um, I try to put it way in the middle of the compost pile if I do use things like that. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go over this too much. Um, I'm looking at where it says weeds on the green side. I do not put weeds that I've harvested from my yard in my compost pile. That's just my preference. I will actually put them in my green can to go to, excuse me, to go to the um, uh, to get picked up by the refuse company. It's just something that I do that way. I don't have to worry about trying to get it really super hot. If it happens to go to seed, they happen to go to seed before I get them in the compost pile. Because you want to make sure that all those seeds are killed if you're using weeds. I've heard about people doing what they call solarizing, where they actually throw the weeds in the sun for a while to make sure they're absolutely dead and they killed the seeds before they throw it in the compost pile. I don't do that, but you know, you can always try it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we have our compost decomposers. We have micro, which are the microbes, uh, bacteria and fungi that breaks down the organic materials and that's what's gonna heat up your compost pile. So, uh, macroorganisms, um, we have earthworms, beetles, snails, uh, and you want to make sure that you shred those materials into smaller pieces, as I said earlier, because they break down a lot faster if you do that. Okay, next slide, please. Materials to avoid. These, you can see that the bottle the can and the jar are all inorganic items. Um, so we don't wanna put those in there. You also don't wanna put glossy or treated any kind of treated paper or cardboard in there. Um, sometimes you might get a food container that has been treated on the inside and you can see from the outside to the inside that there's a uh, one is much more much much shinier on the inside than it is on the outside. Okay, do not use treated or painted wood. Um, do not put disease, poisonous, or invasive plants. And again, like I said, don't use, don't put weeds in there unless you're sure the seeds are dead. Um, stay away from uh, fish pro or meat products in general, and bones. Uh, no dairy products. No fat grease or oil, or very important, do not put your pet uh, waste in there. Keep it as, I mean, I want to say vegetarian as possible, put it that way. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Um, types of composting. Again, we've talked a little bit about cold composting. Uh, I've done this many times where I don't worry about the compost pile. I just kind of throw it in a part of my yard that I don't see too often. Um, but the only bad thing about this, if it doesn't get hot enough, it's not gonna kill those weed seeds or um, some pathogens may survive. It does take a long time when they say one plus years. Um, I agree with that. I would even say, uh, I've, uh, I think I've had a cold compost pile that 
I've finally gotten compost out of after maybe about two years. So, okay. Next slide, please. Now, if you're really gung-ho on composting, this is what you do. You have the hot compost pile because those temperatures really need to be high to make sure you kill, make sure everything is being killed. It's gonna kill weed seeds and it's gonna kill pathogens. Um, if you're very uh, gung-ho about a hot compost pile, it can really only take, um, I think I've read one article where it took maybe about three months to do a, um, to have compost, if you do a hot compost pile. Now, in order to get this hot compost pile, there are some things you need to do. So next slide, please. And one of the most important things to do is to turn your pile. So, um, you know, you go out there, uh, once it's been going, I usually try to turn a pile about maybe once a week, um, which will actually induce it to become hot. It um, it actually adds air to the pile. It releases some heat and it will actually distribute the moisture and nutrients throughout the pile. It also will shred and break up materials. I find the best thing to use, I've tried using uh, a shovel before and shovels don't work. You really do need a pitchforks work the best. I know here it says two to three times a week when the pile is hot. Uh, I've done it, like I said, once a week. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, very important. You want to keep your compost pile uh, moist. The uh, rule of thumb is usually as moist as maybe a wrung out sponge. So, you know, think of when you're washing your dishes and you squeeze out that sponge to get out um, the uh, water when you're done washing. Uh, feel that sponge not very wet, it's not dripping. Obviously there's nothing you can do about it when it rains, unless it's covered. Uh, I have uh, one compost pile that is not covered. So um, it's gonna get wet when it rains, but just go out there and you know turn it when you can. Obviously it's gonna be pretty heavy if it's soaked with water like that, but that might dry it up a little bit. And if it's too dry, you know, that microbe activity is going to slow down. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, best practices. We talked about uh, finely chopping you know, materials need to be smaller. So if you do cut, if you do trim your trees and you have branches, they probably should go on a chipper if you have one available, of course. Um, otherwise, uh, you don't want to put anything bigger than a half to one and a half inch pieces. So you don't want to throw branches into a pile. So you want to shred or grind woody material and leaves. The size of the pile, um, three by three, three feet tall by three feet wide by three feet deep. And these, this, it will shrink as it's, uh, you know, becoming hotter and it's you have you added the water to it it will shrink and if you could start we don't want to really add anything to it you know to let it continue to compost but when you first start it you want to make sure that you put all your stuff in at the beginning and if you want to start a new pile go ahead and do that maybe you know to the side or something i wouldn't add anything onto the old pile just let it continue to break down. But that's just something that I do. I'm not sure it's actually something that is uh, recommended. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, when is it ready? Uh, you can pretty much tell. It's it uh, it's very crumbly, it's loose, it, uh, loose, it smells earthy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or uh, original materials have fully broken down, so you're not gonna, you shouldn't see paper in there. You shouldn't see, um, if you actually use shredded paper, you shouldn't see 
pieces of cardboard or plants of any kind, uh, it should look like the photos that are shown on the right of your screen. And the pile has shrunk down to about one third of its initial size. So, and um, it really does look like this. <laughs> so, okay, next slide, please. Uh, using finished compost soil amendment, um, add it to your regular garden soil uh, into the top four to six inches of garden soil. It improves the soil health, water retention, and drainage. You can also use it as a mulch on top of the soil around the uh, plants and trees. But if you do put it around a tree, don't put it right up to the uh, trunk. You want to keep it away from the trunk by a couple of inches. So just to kind of let that uh, trunk breathe a little bit. You don't want to pile that mulch up to the uh, trunk of the tree. And that goes for wood chips as well. Okay, it will prevent weeds and retain soil moisture. And of course, we want to think about that living in, well, down here, If you, I know if you're in the mountains, it's different. But down here, we want to think about retaining that soil moisture. And actually, yeah, okay, this says a foot away from tree trunks. I said a couple of inches, so I stand corrected. So yeah, you don't put it up against the trunk. Now, something you can also use it as a potting mix in container plants. I've also used it to make compost tea, which um, probably good for another, that'd probably be another lesson, another talk, but um, that's a really good supplement to use on the leaves. You can spray it on the leaves of your plants. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here we have some composting systems. We have that open pile. Uh, that's just throwing stuff in a pile like that. Yep, you can do that in the corner of your yard if you want. Closed plastic bins. Um, I've had one of these and uh, I find they're kind of hard to use because they only have that little door at the bottom because um, you have to be able to turn your pile and this might make it a little difficult to do that. The um, I'm not familiar with the high tech one. So that's something totally different. I'm not familiar with that. I haven't used it. Um, open plastic bin, like maybe a trash can. Again, um, it might be kind of hard to turn a pile like that, but I suppose you could dump it out and then put it back in. That'd be a way of uh, using it. Wire bins. I could see this working pretty well because you're still able to reach inside. It's just not covered. That might be the downside. Okay, lower left-hand corner, the tumbler. I actually have one of these. I find, <coughs> excuse me, I find that they actually dry out very quickly. So they're great to turn. They're really easy to turn because all you have to do is spin it. But I think uh, because it's totally enclosed, they seem to dry out rather quickly. So you kind of need to be on it as far as like keeping uh, it moist. Okay, worm bin, I think that's something that's probably going to be talked about. Um, Debbie's probably going to be going into that a little bit more. Okay, um, I do have a wooden one, not quite like the wood wire three bin system that they have here, but I just took some one by sixes and um, screwed them together to make a bin very similar to this. And um, what's really nice about that, if you make it one side open, it's really easy to turn. Okay, and then we have, here's another example of the concrete block, when they say three bin system, you could actually transfer the uh, <clears throat> compost while, it, while it's, uh, you know, once it starts to break down and change in the compost, you can actually transfer it into a new area of the, uh, of the bin. Actually, I think it's probably the, uh, the idea behind that. I have not tried one of these. I've always meant to. But, um, you know, if you had the space, you know, go for it. Okay, next slide, please. Or I think this is the last one. Okay, yeah, this is where Debbie's gonna take over. 
but are there any questions about um, just regular composting? I know someone asked me, how do the decomposers get into this tumbler? I'm sure they, <laughs> uh, actually, I, I never really thought about it. I mean, you can really, anything except worms are not gonna be able to crawl up the side. Um, maybe that's one of the downsides. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I haven't gotten too much in the way of compost out of that tumbler. So the only thing it might be good for is just to turn some of the things. So, yeah, one thing you can do with the tumblers, and that's correct, that you're not going to get, it's not in connection with the ground. So ideally, you would like to have your compost right on the ground. But one thing you could do is just add a few handfuls of soil into it. And it's kind of amazing, like you wouldn't think that anything could get in there, but you know, sometimes flies will go in there and lay their eggs, you know, if it's open enough. Um, so I, I guess I've been kind of surprised at how many critters find their way there, but I think most people think that the best way to get, get the microbes in there is to just put a handful of soil in there every once in a while. But yeah, that is one of the downsides. Yeah, and I can see that also. Um, but um, they, it does have holes in it. There are holes in the tumbler itself. So something I, I'm sure is able to move in. I think what the only, I think what's really good about a tumbler or something like that off the ground is that you're not going to get critters in it. I mean, like animals, like raccoons or rats or anything along that along that line, so. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Barbara, I, I just put a, this is Michelle, I put a little comment in the um, in the chat where I I got from a friend one of the, the just the black sort of plastic-like um, standard bin with the lid on it. Yeah. And because we have I don't know, gophers, rats, whatever. I attached a, a quarter inch um, screen to the bottom of it so they wouldn't all just dig right in from up underneath. <laughs> yeah, um, great, great idea. Great yeah. idea. Uh, did you use some um, like metal fabric? I just bought, you know, chicken wire. Yes, it's like, I don't know, it's like chicken wire. They sell it at mm. Home Depot. Hardware cloth. Hardware cloth, yeah, and it and when they yeah. sell it, it's in a roll that has, it's wrapped with a piece of wire, and that yeah. piece of wire was what I used to attach it to the bottom of the bin. I'd kind of sewed it on. Nice. <laughs> it nice. worked great, and so far so good. Okay, good. Yeah, because sometimes um, chicken wire breaks down rather quickly when it's in the soil. I've I found, and um, a lot of times it won't even keep out um animals whether it's ground squirrels or you know gophers or what have you but the metal um fabric i call it that it's probably the wrong term but the mesh is much closer together and the the uh, material is much um stronger yeah it seems strong so like yeah, i said yeah. so far it's it's working <laughs> It'll probably last for um you know it could last five to ten years I use it um, as a uh, gopher protection uh, at the bottom of my raised bed. But it does break, it does break down after, after a while. It will kind of rot out, but should be good for, for a long while. Okay. Can I just make, uh, I'm looking at the chat. Can I just respond yes. to one of the comments? Okay. Um, it says one of the things when using sawdust, be sure it hasn't been treated. Yeah, it's a very good point. So, um, and it it seems to me that I have heard, I haven't necessarily read that sawdust, too much sawdust may not be a good thing. But I'm yeah, that. I think what it does is it may, it doesn't allow enough air in. If things are ground up too fine, then it becomes kind of like mud, like mushy. 
and enough air can't get in there. So it can cause the pile to smell. So, um, you know, it's important to have enough things that are coarse, uh, like especially coarse browns to let the air in to the pile. That's my understanding. Okay. But um, are we, do you think we're ready to move on? I had one more question. In a sure. cold composting, do you ever end up with a mystery plants such as like a potato plant from a potato peel or tomato plants? Absolutely. Yeah, I've thrown, <laughs> I've thrown jack-o'-lanterns in there or, or maybe seeds from making a jack-o'-lantern. And uh, yeah, I've had... Uh, Nice volunteers of the pumpkin start. Yeah, some people like that. Eventually, I've had them. I've never had one, you know, go all out. I eventually <laughs> they end up dying anyway. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Why don't we, um, in the interest of time, uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, Michelle says, I had a cherry tree. <laughs> That's funny. Growing in your growing it, in your uh, compost. Yeah, I transplanted it into a container. <laughs> okay, for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing as long as you get it out of there before it becomes like a real tree in your compost pile. <laughs> but all right, so let's uh, move on to uh, vermicomposting. I think this will be quick. So. Um, Vermicomposting is just composting with worms. So we're using uh, the worms as our primary decomposers, and then we're gonna take that organic waste and uh, they're gonna turn it into compost. Um, and what you get out of it is called vermicompost, uh, also called worm castings or manure. And that has all the great uh, beneficial nutrients and microbes. Um, that plants need to grow. And it's a really uh, convenient way to recycle your kitchen scraps uh, to use in the garden as compost. And vermicompost really is based uh, mainly on kitchen scraps because if you put a large amount of yard waste into your vermicomposting bin, it's gonna start to heat up you know, like a traditional compost pile and the worms, that might not be the best thing for the worms. So usually we keep it to um, food scraps. All right, so compared to uh, traditional backyard composting, the benefits of vermicomposting are that it's gonna, it requires less labor. You don't have to turn anything. Uh, and space than traditional backyard composting it can be done in uh, any size bin. So you can go from like a shoe box to a really big um, container. And it can be done both indoors and outdoors, but you could uh, theoretically keep that uh, vermicomposting bin under your sink. I keep mine uh, in my dining room, believe it or not, and it doesn't smell. I haven't had any pest uh, issues with it. Um, and it's also kid friendly because it's like having it's like having a thousand pets uh, in your in your compost bin. So uh, kids really enjoy it. All right, so uh, to get started with vermicomposting, you really don't need very much at all. Um, you need the worms, uh, you need a worm bin, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can actually make it yourself or you can buy one, um, some bedding and food waste, and that, that's it. And so um, if you're composting with worms, you might be tempted to use the biggest worm you can find, uh, like a night crawler. But actually, the best kind of worms to use are the red wiggler, uh, which are very, they're um, both different kinds of earthworms, but the red wiggler is, it eats a lot for its size and uh, does well in the confines of a bin. So the nice thing about the red wiggler uh, is it's a surface dweller. So 
it adapts well to those confined conditions, whereas um, most earthworms like to bury, burrow very deep. And it also can uh, tolerate temperatures, a wider range of temperatures than most earthworms from 50 to 90 to degrees, although they tend to prefer, uh, say, 55 to 75. And they can eat as much as half their weight uh, in food scraps uh, each day, and they can reproduce uh, rapidly. And they only live about a year, but if they keep reproducing, it's going to keep the population uh, fairly, fairly stable. Although, you know, depending on how big your bin is and how much you're feeding, you could increase the population to um, uh, get more, more um, worms. And you can either uh, purchase worms locally or online. Um, if you can purchase locally, it's a little bit better because then you're not going to lose any worms in tr transit, especially in the summer. Um, and I got some of my worms at uh, Riverside County Department of Waste Resources. I took the master composter class there and they gave us uh, about 25 worms to, to start with. And then there are other, um, there are other individuals and organizations that do uh, sell in Southern California. Um, and sometimes you have to ask around to uh, find them. There is a list on the Riverside County Department of Waste Resources uh, website of some of the uh, sellers in California. And then you can order them uh, online to be shipped. All right, so then, um, and then Erin says, uh, that's where she got her worm farm too. Yeah, they, you, they actually have workshops over at Riverside County where you can uh, make your own worm bin. They have all the tools there. So the one I got from Riverside is uh, the picture in the top right. And those are just bins you can get at any big box uh, hardware store, you know, nothing, nothing fancy there at all. So there's pretty much uh, a worm bin for you, no matter you know what kind of material you like. You can have plastic, you can have um, fabric, you can have wood, uh, you can put it in the ground, above ground, you can use uh, various kinds of buckets. You can use the buckets from the, um, from the big box stores, or you can even use kitty litter buckets, I heard are, are really good. Or you can, uh, like on the left-hand side, you can see ones that have like several levels to them. So uh, lots of lots of different choices, and you can go as simple as you know a shoebox with uh, some holes cut on the top, and it'll be just fine. They're not super. They're not super fussy as long as you're feeding them and keeping their bedding moist. So this is the uh, worm bin design um, that they use at uh, Riverside County Department of Waste Resources. And this is the one that I have. And essentially it's just two, uh, two of the plastic bins that nest inside each other. And the top bin, uh, which is labeled as bin A here, is where all the action happens. You've got your bedding in there. Uh, you got your worms, uh, you feed the worms in there, they produce the castings in there. And then you have holes in that bin, uh, which you cover with screen material just to keep the, uh, the insects out. And then a lid on the top and the lid, uh, you could put holes in the lid, but um, in the one I have, I have not found it to be necessary. And then you put what they call a news, uh, newspaper blanket on the top. So you just take a bunch of pieces of newspaper and you fold them nicely and then put them on the top. And if you keep that moist, it kind of keeps the whole uh, bin moist. The only issue is where do you find uh, real newspaper these days? And I found out they don't even um, uh, they don't even sell uh, real newspapers at Barnes and Noble anymore. So. Anyway, um, and then on the inside, you've got your bedding and there's different materials you can use. We're going to get to that. And that's where you feed them. And then um, since you're spraying some water in there to keep it moist, you might. And also um, the worms are continually um, making more manure. Uh, you have some drain it, drainage holes on the bottom 
uh, that let that excess liquid out. And then um, that will go into the bottom uh, container. And also uh, you can put water in the bottom of the bottom container uh, and that helps moderate the temperature. So it keeps it a little bit warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer, depending on where you're putting your bin. I keep mine uh, inside pretty much all year round. And then um, you can put some blocks in there uh, to prop up that top container. Um, the ones that I use are made of uh, styrofoam and that keeps the bins from becoming airlocked and making them hard to separate. Um, but, you know, not, not, not strictly necessary, but a nice feature. And uh, yeah, so all you really need to do is drill the drainage holes at the bottom and the air holes at the top, and then put some like window screen material on that. And so for the, for the bedding, um, there are several different materials you can use. Uh, the purpose of the bedding is to provide a moist environment and also it serves as a backup food source uh, just in case you go on vacation or uh, forget to feed your worms. And you wanna fill the bin about half to three quarters full of bedding, but after a while it does go down quite a bit and uh, you are gonna harvest your worm bin at some point and replace the bedding. Um, and some of the bedding materials you can use are torn newspaper, uh, coconut fiber, coconut core, or peat moss. And I've even seen some people use um, some dried leaves in there. And you wanna soak that material in water and then squeeze it out and then just kind of fluff it up. Uh, and place it, place it in the bin. And then um, periodically you wanna add a handful of sand or um, soil or crushed eggshells uh, for the worm's digestion. They like that, that grit helps them digest their food. And then you're gonna place that, those pieces of newspaper, your newspaper blanket on the top to retain the moisture and also keeps it dark in there. Uh, because worms like a dark environment. So in general, no matter what kind of um, bin uh, container you're using, it's best to have it opaque. And then, especially in the summer, you wanna spray the bedding and the blanket regularly with water. In the summer, it could be even several times a day. And then um, add, depending on how big your um, bin is, add one quarter to one pound of worms. And to give you an idea, um, a one pound of worms could be about a thousand worms. Um, in my bin, I have a um, 13 gallon bin and I, I started with the 25 worms that I got from, from Riverside County. That really wasn't enough. Um, so I ended up getting some more worms. So now, you know, I think I raised it to maybe about 300 worms. And now I'm not sure how many I have. I have, I think I have a lot more than that. So, yeah. And Erin says her worms multiply. Maybe she um, fed them better than I did. But yeah, mine's, mine kind of stayed about 25. <laughs> but now, now that I added all those other worms, now they're doing great. And the one thing that's really funny is when I first got the worms, they were really, really small. And um, now I've been feeding them a ton, a lot, much more lately than I have in the past. And they've gotten really long, which is really interesting. So they're definitely, definitely eating a lot and multiplying a lot. So anyway, after you put the uh, bedding in there, you want to allow the worms to acclimate for a week uh, before feeding them. All right, so feeding the worms, do's and don'ts. And pretty much it's, it's kind of similar to what you would do for your backyard compost pile, but, um, but it's... Um, more to do with food. So uh, pretend that your worms are mostly vegan and you're gonna feed them fruit and vegetable scraps. You could give them pasta, bread, cereal, grain, uh, grains, things like that, but without any oil or sauce on there. 
um, coffee grounds, um, also the coffee filters, tea leaves, and the, the tea bags, as long as they're made of paper. Um, for the eggshells, you really want to finely crush them because the little poor little worms, they, um, they uh, can't, uh, can't really take a whole eggshell, eat a whole eggshell. So I put them in a coffee grinder and then I sprinkle them over the top. And then they, they also like paper and newspaper. So you can put paper towels and napkins, especially dirty ones. Um, and then you want to avoid yard waste, uh, mainly because of the issue I talked about before that you're going to end up with a hot compost pile and some uh, very hot worms. Uh, you want to make sure that you wash your fruits and vegetables just as you would for yourself. So there's no chemicals on them. And then Betsy asked about the pH. And so uh, citrate, you really want to keep acidic foods down to a minimum. So citrus fruit and peels, I personally don't put them in there, but I think you can get away with a small amount, uh, but you just don't want it to, to be, um, you don't want it to be very spicy. You don't want a lot of salt that's going to dry out the worms. And then, um, you want to avoid uh, meat, fish, bones, because uh, that's not what worms eat. Also dairy products, fat, grease, and oil. Uh, so pretty bland diet for the worms. And then uh, mostly avoid processed foods because you never know what kind of chemicals are in there. Maybe some more of the natural foods, but like uh, maybe like bread would be about as processed as I go, so. And then for feeding, uh, you want to make sure to avoid any pest problems. You want to bury the food uh, in the bedding and then cover it with the newspaper blanket. So it'd be kind of difficult for those pests to uh, get to it. And then monitor how much the worms are eating uh, before you add more food because you don't want to keep throwing tons of food in there and then just have it rot. And then, you know, check, check around. Um, my, my worms like uh, avocados, but they're not usually the um, peel of the avocado really isn't going to break down that much over time. They're not going to eat that. So I'll take those out after a while, or maybe even like I put um, banana peels in there. And after a while, I might take out the peel if it hasn't, if it hasn't been eaten or rotted. Um, and then Michelle says they love stale corn tortillas. I have not tried that. Um, I gave mine um, gluten-free bread. They did not like that at all. Apple cores, mine love apple cores. They love, um, they also love um, any kind of mushy fruit. Um, they love sweet, mushy fruit and avocados. Those are their favorite things. And it says if you have juice, the pulp is great for worms, great ideas. Um, and then you can use, if you want to get really fancy and you have a bigger bin, you can use the zone feeding method, which means like one day you'll put the, the food in one place and then the next day you'll, you know, put it somewhere else in the bin and you just kind of keep moving it around. So the worms are, um, uh, are living throughout the bin. And so here are some tips and tricks for successful, um, worm composting. You want to keep the bedding damp, but not soaking wet. You don't want to drown your worms. Um, and you want to locate the uh, bin in a shady spot. You don't want it, uh, you don't want to, uh, again, overheat your worms. And um, in the summer, you know, in the summer, if it gets really hot, you could actually uh, fill some plastic bottles with um, water and then freeze them and then put those over the top of the newspaper blanket, you know, as some air conditioning if you want. Um, and they prefer temperatures between 55 to 75, but as I uh, mentioned before, they can go a little bit uh, below and above that, like maybe up to 90. Um, and then Start small, start with a few worms in a smaller bin, and then uh, you can always increase the size of your bin or add more bins as the worms reproduce. Uh, and don't overfeed them. And that's mainly because you don't want a lot of rotting food uh, in there. It's not gonna smell 
really good. So just see what they like, give them what they like. And um, I've just found that um, the more I feed them, the more I get and the bigger they get. So because <laughs> I, I got a little bit lazy and I just started throwing things in there, which I had not done before. And then you want to avoid acidic or spicy, spicy foods. They really like it, things very mild. And then um, you can cut, always cut the food into smaller pieces, or you can even put it all in a, you know, you can put your food scraps in a blender and just pour it in and then um, place the food uh, in various places around, around the bin. And then this picture just shows what the cocoons look like. And each of those cocoons has several babies in them. So when you harvest your bin, um, save those cocoons and then uh, move them back into the bin when you clean it. Okay, so um, what, what is this thing all about? So what do you get at the end? Well, you get these worm castings, the worm manure, and it's gonna look like, it's actually gonna look like kind of mud, muddy soil. It's like dark brown, it's muddy. It has all those great plant nutrients and microorganisms in there. And so when you start to see a lot of that um, soily mud in there, and there's more of that than there is of the other bedding, then it's probably time to harvest. Uh, and most bins are ready to harvest in four to eight months, but um, they will kind of eat their manure again, I think up to several times. So uh, again, they're, they're not super fussy. If you have to go a little bit longer than that, it's fine. Um, and it may, you know, harvesting a bin is kind of a half day affair, at least for me, you know, if you do it by yourself. And what harvesting means is that you're just going to separate the worms from the castings. So you're going to, and I'm going to show in a moment different ways to do that, but essentially you're going to pick out the worms and then you're going to put the worms in one place and the castings in another place. And then you're going to use the castings uh, in your garden. And so um, once, you once you separate them, then you could, if you have too many worms, you can move them to uh, another bin or give them to a friend. And then um, you're gonna, so essentially you take out the worms, you're gonna remove all the castings and other stuff that's in there. You know, maybe there's some excess food in there. You're gonna move, remove that. And then you're gonna clean out the bin uh, and put in fresh bedding and return the worms and the cocoons to the bin. So what do I mean by harvesting? So again, you're trying to separate the worms from the castings and you can do that several different ways um, and you can combine the different methods. So uh, you can have the, uh, you try to relocate the worms. So uh, you only have castings. So if you dump out your bin, say in your backyard on a tarp and if the sun is shining, they're gonna they're gonna dive deep into um, into that pile, and so you'll be able to scoop up the castings from the top. And every time they see the light, they'll just keep uh, digging down in there. Uh, also, you can in your bin you can put um, the worm you can put the food on one side for a week or so, and all the worms are gonna move to that side, and then you'll be able to. Um, take the castings from the other side. And then, um, then um, you can also, this is what I did uh, in the lower left. I just pretty much took, scooped out a handful of stuff, put it on a tarp, and then picked the worms out, put the worms in a bowl or something, and um, put the castings in a bucket. And that's how I separated them. And again, it takes you know, it takes hours, uh, but it's very meditative. It's kind of uh, kind of good. Put on some soft music, and then um, you know, in bigger operations, uh, they use screens and centrifugal force. So they actually kind of spin the worms and the castings around. So I think you know they get the worms stay in there inside the screen, and then the castings come out. I don't know how many worms they lose by doing that, but you can do uh, larger amounts that way. Or you can make your own screen 
and put it in say a wooden frame and then you put you know you dump your bin on top of that and then the worms will stay at the top and then you can um, get the castings to go through the screen but those are, are various ways but essentially harvesting just means uh, you know harvesting the castings that you're going to use for your garden. All right, so how do you use uh, worm castings? Um, a lot of the same ways that you would use um, your traditional compost. So you can use it as a top dressing. You'll spread a layer of castings uh, either on your lawn or on top of your soil and then make sure you water it in. But very, uh, be uh, very judicious about how much you put in because it's very, very potent. So if you use it as a soil amendment, you're only gonna mix one part castings with five parts garden soil um, or planting mix, and then you're gonna you know, mix it up and um, mix it together. Um, and then for container plants, you could mix the castings in the same way with potting soil or sprinkle a little bit on the soil surface. Uh, you can add it to a seed starting mix or um, Barbara was talking before about worm tea uh, or she was talking about compost tea, you can make worm tea uh, in a similar way. You take a scoop of worm castings in some kind of fabric bag or mesh bag, and then um, soak it in a five uh, gallon bucket of water for a day or two or three. And some people will actually put a bubbler in there. Um, and then you're going to remove the bag and then you're going to have something that's going to look, it's going to be like a medium brown color. And then you can use that to um, either pour into your um, beds or to spray on plant leaves. And it's important, you know, since there's a lot of beneficial microbes uh, in there in the castings, uh, you want to use them as soon as you can after harvesting, you know, while everything's still living in there. Or if you store it, uh, you want to make sure it's in a non-airtight container. You know, the air is getting in there so those microbes can uh, live and grow and at moderate temperature and keep that, keep that moist. Okay, just a few more slides. Um, then before I talked about the worm leachate, and that's the water that just drips out the bottom of that main bin into the bottom, the top bin into the bottom bin. Um, and so that is not quite as potent as worm tea. Um, it's not really uh, just kind of dripping through that bedding. So it's not really going through the worm's digestive tract. Um, and you don't want to have too much leachate coming out of your worm bin because that probably means it's too wet. And then if it doesn't smell good, if it's been sitting there for weeks and weeks, uh, you probably don't want to use that. But then you know, mix that as needed uh, with water if you have to, to make something that looks like weak tea. I find that I don't have to mix mine at all because it's already, there's a lot more water in there than leachate on the bottom of my bin. And then you can pour it on the soil, plant uh, or spray it on uh, the leaves. Okay, so let's uh, wrap this up. I realize we're over a little bit in time. Um, so composting and vermicomposting is beneficial for the environment. We want to keep that organic waste out of the landfill. So it's a way to recycle organic waste and also um, control climate change and keep methane from going into our atmosphere. Um, and the benefits of compost are that it's improving the soil by providing those beneficial plant nutrients. Uh, it can decrease the amount of fertilizer we, we use, which means it's not uh, seeping down into our groundwater. And if we use it as a mulch, it's going to prevent those weeds and retain moisture in the soil. Um, and hot composting, and that's in the kind of composting without worms, uh, makes compost faster, but it does require some effort to optimize the conditions. You'll be turning it and watering it. And then um, vermicomposting uses worms. Those are the primary decomposers. So it's doing the same thing, uh, converting that food waste into compost. And what you get out of that are the worm castings or the worm manure. And, um, and then the keys to successful vermicomposting are 
uh, maintaining the right conditions in the worm bin. So you want to control you know, control moisture, not too wet, temperature, not too hot, not too cold, ventilation, you know, enough air going in there. And then you want to feed them the right amount and right type of food. So before we move on, um, any questions on vermicomposting, you can either put them in the chat or come off mute. And I see that we do have a few worm composters out there today. I think once you get started with it, it be, it's kind of addictive. It seems kind of gross when you think about it, but it's actually really fun. We have one question. <clears throat> what do you mean by harvest? Um, I think I tried to. Did I explain that enough, um, Aaron? Yes. Do I need to dilute the leche or is it okay to apply directly? Um, it really depends on how diluted it is when it comes out. I find that mine, I don't get that much um, leachate. So when it goes into the water in the bottom of the bin, it does not need to be diluted. I would say as long as it's kind of like a tea color, it's probably fine. Um, but if it's like really, really dark, then you would, then you would um, uh, add water to it. Um, I have a quick question, uh, Deborah. Yeah. This is Michelle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you um, have you started up some worm worm bins with the elementary school classes yet? Um, Maggie is the one who's in charge of that. I know that, um, I don't know how many requests she's gotten mm -hmm. recently, but I did see like four of those, um, worm bin shoe boxes, uh, in the office. <laughs> so I know, hey, I know um, it's ready to go. <laughs> this is, this is Lori. So I presented and created the, the first worm bin this year with Micah House, was it last oh. week or the week before? Fantastic. So that was my my first turn at that. It was a lot of fun. The kids were really uh, enthusiastic. And the the Micah House gal, she said, oh, they can touch the worms if they want to. Oh, they can touch the peat, you know, the, the core block if they want to. So we had a lot of fun. Beautiful. And uh, so uh, there will be some future ones. There's nothing really set. But, um, oh, I know that uh, D, uh, you know, the master food preserver um, coordinator yes. uh, with uh, a group that she's working with, um, we're going to be doing some with them. Um, I, we just haven't actually timed that out yet. It's probably going to be uh, beginning of the year. Yeah. Is that um, Urbita Elementary? Urbita, yeah. Urbita, yeah. yeah. So Denver. that's going to be beginning of the year. Um, so I uh, probably nothing nothing for the rest of the year but yeah i think next year um everything will be kind of like uh you know in in, in process so yeah that, that's great and fun. do you do you leave it with I, them for a month or at all uh, or they, are, they are it will be yeah they have the bin and it will they're probably going to keep it so oh. at least for them i'll be checking in with uh princess uh, because she's the contact person yeah. uh, with Micah House and probably go back for a visit in a month just to see how everything's going. And they're going to, I think they're going, uh -huh. I, I said, well, keep a, keep a diary uh, for me so I can see, well, when are you feeding them? Did you name your worms? Have you seen the egg cases yet? Um, and then, so probably in about a month, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to visit them. And I suspect that they will keep theirs. Uh, for the schools, they have an option of, you know, seeing it and not keeping it or keeping it for a month or keeping it for the semester or quarter or always keeping it. So um, it's very open ended on that per Maggie. Yeah. And Michelle says, you know, it's so perfect for kids. A worm diary is a good idea. I agree. Yeah. So you have to make sure that some somebody's feeding the worms. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Well, what did you feed them today? And did, did they like this or not like that? So, um, and they, uh, you know, they have healthy foods that they're eating. So, you know, they're they'll they'll be getting their fill of uh, apple cores and um, and 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 good stuff like that. Very cool. Very cool. 
Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, and Barbara says, thank you. I also wanna mention in case anybody knows of anybody who's interested is we have, we actually have a kit for teaching um, uh, compost in a jar. And I'm gonna be bringing that to Bradley Elementary with a teacher that I worked with uh, last year. And that's also through FNAP, through Princess. And um, what the kids do is they, um, they get into groups and then they do six jars of compost. So they put together their greens and browns and some soil. And then they put some fabric over the top and put a rubber band on it. And um, they shake it periodically, like every week they'll shake it and add spray some water in it. And then they watch it over a period of uh, six or more weeks to see how it breaks down. So we also have that as uh, something that's really easy to teach. So that's available if anybody uh, knows of an anyone who's interested. Oh, that sounds really cool. I think I, I want to see your little kid on that. That's that sounds cool. Oh, great. Is that Aaron? Oh, this is Lori. Sorry. I'm, oh. I'm, 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 I'm good. Yeah. <clears throat> Cause yeah, that'd be kind of cool to also add as a, as a, as a side thing to the worm little bin to say, Oh, and you can also do this. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. So Aaron says she's a fourth grade teacher and she would like uh, that. So yes. Great. Yeah. Uh, contact me and we'll, we'll set it. We'll set something up. All right. So All right. Just cool. Just to wrap this up, I um, just want to let you know that we have composting resources on our Master Gardener website, and the, comp the contact info is coming, so just hang, hang in there. Um, so um, we have, uh, if you look, if you go to the Master Gardener website and you look on the left-hand side on the menu there, there's something called recent presentations. And then under recent presentations, it has resource sheets and videos. So it will have the slides in PDF format on there. And then also some resource sheets on composting and vermicomposting. And then it has a link to our videos. And we have a whole library of videos on YouTube. And you can find that in uh, the UCCE San Bernardino YouTube channel. So this will be going, this presentation will be going up there uh, eventually. And uh, that's, uh, that's all I have. And then um, as far as my contact info, uh, just email me at dschnur at ucanr.edu, or you can uh, Google me on the UCANR website and you will find me. And then if you have any composting questions, you can either email me or you can email the Master Gardener Helpline and it will get, get to me. Um, anything else before we end? Thank you so much, that was really fun. Yeah, I want to uh, thank everybody for um, spending uh, an hour with us. And uh, again, if you have any needs, questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. Have a, have a great evening. <laughs>